<laughs> yep. Okay, so I hit start. Let me make sure we're getting going. Where'd you go to lunch? Uh, I got some KFC. KFC. There's no honor in it. Ooh, can you go? I'll just go get some. Okay. One more piece on this thing. No, you were fine. Lunch now. We are live! Oh, yep. Yeah. The thing I almost never do where I just like straight forget to eat. Yep. And I was, people. was up by the source and was like, well, you have the shortest line. Oh, the KFC? Yeah. The titles didn't sync up. Oh no. Are we live? We, should, we are live. I guess I'll like do my part. Retweet this. Yes. Well, I wrote into a tweet. I'll tell you when to tweet. Do you want me to like keep half an eye on comments or not a single eye? You can keep an eye. Oh, StarCraft 2 stream. That's what people are expecting right now. Okay, right now, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've made it. Um, I told everybody my my goal was diamond by July, and I made it. There you go. I'm diamond 3 right now. The webcam is our heart. Yep. Okay, we okay. got 57 you, people. We're going. Got, got a thing. Oh my goodness. Did you yeah. put this on the Kickstarter too? No, that'll no. be Thursday since we didn't do it. Okay, cool, cool. It's fine. That's all right. We're good. All right, I'm like ready to retweet. Yes. Well, let me Just let me know. Hi, everybody. I've got so much stuff to show you. I hope I don't like trip over myself. Yeah, this is our first what meat space stream. It feels weird. Like, yeah, I like I had planned on like doing this entirely digitally, and it, it doesn't really it's not going to change what I'm going to say. But there was just I wasn't prepared to be staring at a at an iris of a camera. <laughs> yep. Okay. You know what? The tweet's even going to show that we're in meat space. <laughs> there we go. Sweet. Uh, yeah, and no, I'll, I'll get right into it. I have like a little preamble. We're about like an hour, right? Hour and a half? Yeah. It's cool. Easy. Um, I think we've talked for hours about those right now with how much there is. Yeah, I like. I had a moment where I was like, I can't, if I ever have to like give a talk on this game, I won't be able to do it. There's like too much. Um, okay, so we'll get to questions. I'll answer them as best I can. Um, apologies if I'm a little scattered. We're... I'm like knee deep in a very funny uh, development problem, which seems to me to be very big, but is actually like quite small. And it's just because I'm in the weeds and I spent all weekend working on it. Um, okay, one second. Let me, let me properly retweet this and then I'll, I'll get in. Or I just won't worry about it. Or hold on, let me see your phone. <laughs> I'll retweet for you. <laughs> try. Try. Yeah, you can retweet. Since it's so late on. It's all right. We're it's gonna me. we're gonna get right into it. No, you're okay. good. Okay. So what I wanted to start with, can you uh, Gates tell me what? The, can you just tilt the camera, to the, the screen, screen to me? Yep. I just want to see what everyone else is saying. Cool. Great. That gives me what I need to know. Um, so I wanted to start by just talking about like general evolution. So um, first of all, Kid C is here, sort of, almost here. It's very nearly here. We are going to be releasing it um, probably later this week. The, the P, we'll release the print PDFs and the TTS. The print PDFs and stuff are completely ready to go. Um, the TTS is just a couple days late. We have like one weird little bug that we found and we want to make sure it's, it's ironed out. You can turn the screen away from me. Okay. It's, it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know, what, I'm looking at it, so it's scary. Um, what I wanted to do first was to talk a little bit about um, this question that I suspect I've already gotten, but it's a question that gets asked me every stream, which is, how much has the game changed from A to B to C? Uh, and in general, what has the post-Oath development looked like compared to Root? So I'm going to pose that question to myself. And my, whenever I'm in the weeds, like I am right now, my answer is always like, oh, the game is so different. It's changed so much. Um, but interestingly, uh, that is probably just a consequence of me being completely stuck in, in myself right now. So for instance, this is what a player board looked like for Kit A. This is what we launched the Kickstarter on. And then, let me 
find a print. Uh, here, here is a kit B, or that should be a kit B. This is what we took to um, uh, the last show we went to. Pax. Both maybe, Pax East, maybe right? South. Yeah, this might have been the one that went to. Oh, or Pax in the East. East. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been what they said. So this would have been like yeah. B or B-ish. Mm -hmm. And then uh, today, here's what the player words look like, which is not a huge difference. Um, you know, you have uh, a loosely blocked out turn with three phases, as you can see on the right. You have a selection of actions. You know, here, Kit A, this looks a little bit like uh, the game has gotten more complicated. That isn't true. What happened was, um, this is before the editor started really digging in and doing usability testing. And this board is a little slightly on the wordy side because we are yet to do like the icon pass that it got. So like, before we got things ready for Kickstarter, we kind of like cooked them down a little bit, put some icons in. And then during development, because it's a lot easier to edit a word than an icon, we get kind of wordy. And then right towards the end of development, we tie things back up and we start lowering things down. But in general, what you're seeing here is like pretty close. I'll just flip these over so you can see on the other side. They're, they're, it's pretty close to what it looked like um, it looked like at the start. Now there are some big differences too, and I'll talk about some of them over the stream. But I just wanted to start by kind of zooming out. Um, the other thing that I'm uh, really excited about that you guys are going to get to see for the first time is the new rulebook layout. So here's the rule book, for, these are the rules for Kit B. And the only thing I want you to pay attention to here is that it's uh, 28 pages long. <laughs> um, they're long rules. Now, there were a lot of illustrations in them, and we had a lot of examples, here's a nice component spread, etc. But it's still a pretty sizable rule book. Now, that, the size of this rule book is a little strange because I would tell people frequently when they ask me how complicated Oath was, I would usually say, it's about like one and a half to two root factions worth of complexity. And I'm, I'm still standing by that. I think just by um, words, in terms of like the actual words in um, a sort of legalistic rule book, it's not really that long of, of actual rules. Uh, what is harder about Oath is that root um, helps you win. Like right at the start of the game, it tells you exactly what you need to do to win. And even if you're not playing very well, it'll still let you score a few points, especially in the early game. Oath doesn't do that. Oath doesn't have victory points. It won't help you win if you're not trying to win. And uh, part of the fun of the game is trying to orient yourself in this weird world and all the pressures that are, that are kind of being placed upon you. Uh, and so it was important, because the game is so open, to allow the players to float a little bit. I think that's uh, some of the fun of the game. Now, what we found, though, was this rule book scared people. It scares me a little bit, too. It's just... It, it presents kind of everything up front and tries to give a kind of detailed tutorial for every single system. So what we've done instead, is for, and you, you'll see this in Kit C, is we've divided the rule book into a law over here on the right and a uh, playbook. So the playbook works in, uh, so let me, I should say, the Kit C doesn't include all the teaching materials that we will include in the final games because we're still testing them and working on them. But the playbook is built to work with a tutorial that will operate in the same way Fog of Love uh, teaches people how to play the game, where when you first open your game, there'll be a card that will say, hey, this is called Packet A, don't open me yet. And this is Packet B, you're going to open me later. And then when you start with the playbook, as you open it up, it'll say, hey, Here's what the inside of your box looks like. Here's what you're doing. If you want to learn how to play the game right now, here's what you need to do. If you're planning on learning how to play it later, here's what you should do. And then it will walk you through the basics of the components. It will instruct you when you need to open up different packets to set up the game. And it kind of introduces you to sort of the major concepts um, some of the, and some of the broad systems. And then all of this will lead in, so for example, you go through all, it, it tells you kind of an overview of what the different actions are without getting into the weeds about how, exactly how they work. We just want to give people a bird's eye view because the game includes a lot of kind of strange and new mechanisms. And so we want to make sure players kind of feel comfortable with that. Then, so in those eight pages, you basically get a general sense of both. Then if you want, you can use the walkthrough, which the game has all of its decks stacked. So you'll be able to roll right into the walkthrough or you can just start playing. Uh, if you if you uh, read the rest of the rules, but.
But the walkthrough, um, these are very loose early drawings, and Josh will get mad at me for showing you this playbook. Um, but basically, the walkthrough takes you through the first two turns of the game, and you can expect to start playing, hopefully, you know, if you open up a copy with brand new players, you could be getting through the first turn of that walkthrough, you know, within a half an hour or 45 minutes, and have everybody have a really good sense of how the game works. The game doesn't normally take that long to teach, but this is from everybody not knowing how to play the game. So right, that's the playbook, and then it tells you, hey, here's continuing play, and also like just some general things about the game, how the game works, and finally like strange things about Oath that work a little bit differently than most other games out there. So you've got this big playbook, which kind of functions like the learning to play in Root, and it is uh, it is buttressed. Thank you. Kids. Mm -hmm. um, it's buttressed by uh, a law which works like the law of Root. And I showed a little bit of this last time I did a development stream. I just want to kind of show you, show you guys again. This is a 12-page rule book. It's not scary. Um, which is a, it's a little bit, the fourth printing of root is a 16-page law. This is a little bit shorter. And a lot of this is going to be, so this actually is first page, is nothing. So we've got a setup, um, glossary, tactical rules, etc. Key components, let's not worry about that. Okay, so imagine that we're like we're now in the, the standard rules. This is the victory and sequence of play spread. One page, two for the minor actions, three, four for the major actions, five for the powers, and that's it. Five pages. Uh, and these rules are, I would say, they're a little bit like the law of root, but like one step less technical. They have the same amount of technical specificity, but there's just a little bit more conversational um, Sort of fluff to kind of hold hold them together, but in general, like just in terms of the sheer number of rules in the game, it's not that scary. It's not that scary. Uh, and and actually, and even though it seems like a lot of other things that I might be getting into today suggest that the game's getting more complicated, by and large, it's lost rules and it's gotten a lot simpler. Um, okay, so that's where we're at. Just a general reminder: I will be on Thursday. We'll be releasing the physical kit and the new TTS mod. We've gone ahead and decided to, decided to just open up the full kit and the full mod for everybody. So everybody at home will have access to the full card list. The TTS mod will have all the features that the internal playtesters have been enjoying. Uh, and, you know, they'll, they'll be, uh, there's absolutely just like a metric ton of game that you guys will be, be able to explore. All right, Gates, hit me. What do people want to know? Awesome. Uh, the bot. The bot, the bot, the bot. Oh, yeah, the bot, the bot, the bot. The bot is very close. I was working on the bot this morning a little bit. Um, what we're going to do, uh, we've had a little, some small time adjustments on the back end, and so while we were doing the end of the development of Kit C, there was one system of the game um, around the way the relics work that had to go through a couple uh, development phases, and so I couldn't get the bot ready while also getting the relic system ready. So now that the, the design is very close to a lock, I'm going to turn and go back to the bot. What I would like to do with Kit C, so usually what we've done is we've released a playtesting kit and then I have moved on the internal version and not worried about providing a direct update for the for kit A. There was never like a kit A 1.1 or whatever. That's the same for kit B. Kit B I think we released in late February-ish maybe. Uh, and we, we never updated it. It was just that was kit B. It was there for everybody. Uh, and now we are to kit C. With kit C I'm going to make a small exception. Uh, when the bot is ready, hopefully in the next several weeks, um, I will be re releasing it publicly and people are going to be welcome to play it with their, uh, with their versions of the game. And I think probably when, when that happens, I will do a long post about the bot and probably a stream just about the bot. Awesome. And then um, somebody's asking about, the is the design of the combat dice final? Uh, like, uh, oh, like how they look? Yeah. I don't even have one out here. Uh, no, it's not, actually. Um, combat is in a really... F uh, so the, the design of the combat dice is not final at all. Um, we actually... It's one of those weird elements that we haven't even like put on the queue because designing a die isn't super complicated uh, compared to some of the other pieces we have to do. So it's just like lower on the list. Um, we'll probably be doing the combat dice pretty soon. We're actually doing a kind of funny thing right now. I'm doing an internal audit of the campaign system. I won't go into it in, in too big a detail, but I'm really going deep in the numbers and there will likely be some small adjustments to how that dice work um, just for balance and for playability and things like that. So like whatever is going to adjust that system is going to 
in, in terms of the strategy of the game, it's going to be largely neutral, but I'm going to just try to do a couple things to kind of like sharpen the emotional impact of fights. Once I have that locked, we'll be able to build the dice design. Uh, one thing I'll say just on the production side, uh, dice, because we do engraved dice usually, uh, and I think we're doing them for this project as well, um, we, we will turn over that pretty soon to the factory so they can start making a mold. So it is sort of like next up on the list. I just have to make sure that the numbers are absolutely where they need to be. Awesome. And then lots of really good questions. Okay, hold on. People so, are still talking about the bot. Um, <laughs> it's all right. Is it still going? Is it also going to be working as an exile citizen? Or that, that's the plan. The, the last time I played with it was with an exile, and it worked pretty well. So I'm I'm quite optimistic that I'm going to be able to make that work. Yeah, and to probably make it clear, the bot will not be featured in this next. No, sorry, bot thing. is not. Yeah, not definitely 100 percent not in Kit C. Sorry. Um, will I will likely do a patch to Kit C, which will come out in a few weeks, or maybe a little bit more than that, maybe uh -huh. that will include the bot. Okay. And then, so many questions. That's all right. The rulebook will be published the same time as the TTS mod, yep. absolutely. Uh, there will be a Kickstarter update with that also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that, um, I, I saw a couple of comments about the Kickstarter. We have like gone slightly light on Kickstarter updates because there's a lot happening in the world and we don't want to like fill people's inboxes with like dozens of Kickstarter yeah, updates. Yeah, so, like, that was for, a big one. Yeah, yeah, for, 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 for the folks who are like, oh wait, what's, what's Oath doing? It's like. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You will get. I mean, I, I feel like I talk a lot about Oath. Yeah. Um, and I'm always happy to answer questions. You'll get inundated. Um, awesome. People are also talking about the board. Walk oh yeah, yeah. Let's talk about the board. So we haven't talked about the board yet. Yeah. Um, the this board has been an interesting journey. <laughs> um, we for a long time had. Let me get. There it is. For a long time, the board looked like this. It was the long stripy board. Which I really liked because um, just sight lines, like if you're mm -hmm. measuring how long, how distant is a card, you want everybody to like have the same sort of like reader's advantage of having to rotate 90 degrees. So if you imagine uh, two players on each side of this board, they're all reading all the cards at a 90 degree ro rotation mm -hmm. instead of some players getting cards fully rotated for them and other players having to do the rotation themselves. So uh, a couple of interesting things happened. So one, uh, well here, I'll just keep this here as, as a contrast. Um, so there were a few interesting things that led to this shift to the new board. So the first thing that led to it was we found that, I'm, just, I'm trying to, it was like, this is five weeks ago? Oh my gosh. Okay. So the first thing that happened is that um, we found that this long board created some very weird um, suggestions or intuitions for how players thought their pawn should move. So if your pawn's up here, you assume that you're always moving like down in this stripe and that this piece is adjacent to this piece. When in fact, the regions in the game really do behave more like islands. So I can like travel to this island or travel to that island or travel to this island. So arranging them in three lines actually help people better intuit the geography of the map. So that's one thing. Another thing is just in terms of like how the game looks. There's a kind of storybook quality when you have everything kind of lined up as if you had opened a very large book. And so we just sort of found that, like this layout looked nicer because it allowed all of the art to be kind of like grounded on the same level as opposed to doing a funny thing where like up here, you know, if you're, if you're reading it like this, it was like this very long strip. It, like, it, didn't, feel, um, it didn't feel like it was in widescreen. I think that's maybe like a strange way of thinking about the problem, but there's just something about the layout that this seemed like it had a lot, something closer to the scope of the game. Now, the main reason why I didn't like, oh, and then there, there was one more important usability thing, which were these discard piles, which are very important in the game, which are here, here, and here. They were getting kind of like lost in the card shuffle. And so this new layout kicks the discard piles up here. It also, because the cradle is smaller, creates a big UI block for some uh, user interface stuff right here. The old board didn't have this. In the old board, the UI was like spread in the strip. And, but by doing it in this way, we actually have like a nice board which sort of grounds the whole design. Um, now, the reason why we actually had uh, looked at a board close to this very early in, um, I just bumped the camera. Uh, very early, before we had launched the Kickstarter, we had a board proposal that looked like this. And I was very worried about it because I was worried that my, me sitting here reading this card upside down, I was gonna just 
mess it up. I was always going to be picking up cards and checking them, picking up cards and checking them. Here's what we found, though. Um, the rules simplified themselves in such a way that most card abilities can be rendered in about two lines of text. There's some of them that are about three lines of text, but most are two. Um, and when every card has a unique piece of art, it, you just remember what, what the card does largely. And because the cards will often stick around for several games in a row, when you look at, at, the, at, the, at the board, you're just going to know what's out there. And an important feature of this design is that the cards cycle through the game rather slowly. So you might have, you know, I might play the Boiling Lake out here to the Lush Coast. It's a funny combination. Um, <laughs> it could stick there all game. And the first time I get hit by the Boiling Lake, I'm going to remember that event. And it's going to kind of, it's going to have a kind of stickiness to it. Whereas a lot of other tableau builders, or even like a PAX game, will cycle through a really large card list. And Oath, just not that many cards are cycled. So what we found is that when I teach the game, I have no problem teaching it upside down. And once players have played two, three times, you can sit on this side of the table just fine. And for new players, what, what we suggest in the rule book is like the teacher will kind of sit here or on the end, and then the other two players will sit kind of facing the board. In the same way that, you know, whenever you're teaching somebody power grid or something, you're going to orient the board to face the new player. Because for an experienced player, it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, so that, that's where the board's at. Now, this meant that um, Kyle... The previous art that Kyle had done for the board, um, it was never final. Um, Kyle had, had, had done that uh, kind of in the hours before his fifth child was born. And so he always knew he was going to be revisiting the board art. And only very recently, um, he's, he's started working on the new board. And what you're looking at here is my very bad Photoshop bash, where I took the art of the old one and just rotated it mm -hmm. 90 degrees. So you can see this beautiful line right here. Um, Which is not final. This not is not final. final. It's not, not final. final. <laughs> but we did send this to the factory to produce a sample. You can see that it's printed on the nice neoprene. Yeah. Um, double stitching. Do double stitching. And we, we sent it to the, the factory because we wanted to get a sense of um, the fidelity of their print. Neoprene's a little funny because the, the inks will bleed a lot because mm -hmm. it's printed on a cloth. And so we wanted, I wanted, and actually Kyle has the other one of our factory samples right now, mm -hmm. so that as he is drawing this new piece, he can be very mindful of like exactly which colors we want to use. And so this is a little bit of a mismatch. I like kept white on it because I wanted Kyle to know how the white would look next to other things. Mm -hmm. This color wash could be replaced with a different color wash. Um, and as we get that final uh, map image, we'll share it with you guys. But yeah, so not final, but the layout is actually quite close to final. Here. Mm -hmm. um, th this track isn't great. It's getting a little bit of work right now. Not double-sided. Right. Not double-sided. So the reason it's not going to be double-sided is because it is just so expensive. Yeah. It is like incredibly expensive uh, for us to do, do it double-sided, and it doesn't. It wouldn't really look right if we used the same art piece. Mm -hmm. So we would have to do have a second map piece plus a second uh, plus like just doubling. This map is pretty much the most expensive component in the box, and to just double that cost is something that's beyond the scope. And then, yep, stitch edging. Um. Yeah, the, this the edge stitching we haven't been able to confirm yet. We would like to do it, but they're like we're we're at the stage of the project where we have to make a couple like budget decisions just to keep it, you know, you know, keep us from going under because we overpromised or something. So we're not sure. We we would like to do it, but it depends. It depends on exactly what the quotes look like. Um, yes, and then talk about sleeping cards because we have introduced the relics. We haven't even talked about the size of the relics. Oh yeah, so Especially relics. Like I don't even like have any, it's fine. Uh, and actually the relics that are out there aren't the right size. So yeah. uh, we had originally planned on making the relics mini euros because it's a pretty common card uh, sleeve size, but there are usability reasons and are aesthetic reasons why they're just better as square cards. So we're probably gonna be using, you can see the silhouette here. We like, <laughs> we had square relics for a while and dropped them and now mm -hmm. they're back. Um, relics will probably be 57 millimeters square, which uh, we will, they will be included in the sleeve pack, don't worry. Um, but if you do not want to buy our sleeve pack, you can just buy bridge sleeves and cut them. Yeah, which is what I think we've done in some cases, right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, we, we, I just don't have any square relics handy. But yeah, the, the relics will be um, 57 millimeter cards. And then the special relics, which I'll, I'll talk about later, are these guys, and they're a little bit bigger. Don't, don't worry about the craziness of this layout. Oh. It's very in progress. Um, I yeah, these are just, these. yeah, I know. These are the special, special relics. These are the special relics, um, the darkest secret in people's favor. Okay. Which have been in the game for a long time, but now like they have a shape that is not a bridge card. 
because we just didn't want them getting confused with the dice. Um, let's talk about the components. We, I don't oh, think yeah, we've cool. actually shown. So, we're going so to to these are not like totally final size or anything like that. Uh, but I'll show you guys some cool components. We're going to use the little camera. Yeah, you're great. Can I see it? All right, cool. Whoa, this. Uh, I'm going to make a little stage. Get the box. Yeah, actually, here's what we do. Just make a little stage. Uh, that's, oh, that's upside down. <laughs> there you go. I'm gonna make a nice little like spread. Look at that. All right, so those are the secrets, and I will um, put some pieces here for for scale. Look at that. That looks great. Um, okay, so the uh, what you're looking at here are the resin secret markers. They have a gold inlay. Yeah. And a really cool little like eyelash binding. Whoop. Back them up a little bit. There we go. There we go. Get that. That's that get manual that focus. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Sorry, I got this little bubble in front of the chancellor. Sorry, chancellor. Um, okay. So the the secret books. I'll put some out here as well. Uh, they are going to be uh, resin. So they're big and chunky. They clap when you um, when you play with them. They're great. Um, and we wanted the secrets to be a little bit bigger. We're not sure this is going to be the final size. It may be a step too large, um, but something similar to this. One thing we like about these secrets is uh, players, uh, they're a renewable resource in the game. So when you use a secret, you will put it on a card, bloop, like that. Um, and then at the end of your turn, you get the, that secret okay. back. Um, and we wanted it to have like a kind of permanence to it, and the resin does a good job uh, conveying that. You know, just from the production side, we had an option to stain them. So here I'll show you uh, side by side. So yeah. We had an option at one point to do a stain, so you can see the stained, uh, is it? Pull it back a little bit more. There, we, there go. we go. Okay, so this one has got the stain and then that one's got the inlay. What we decided to do was to get to do the, the gold inlay. And the reason for that is staining is really, really, really easy. So if, a, if, someone, if one of you folks wants to stain your uh, secret blocks, do it. It's very cheap, it's very easy. Uh, having one of you paint a gold inlay though is like tough. So we'd rather have the factory do the harder thing. Um, but if, and we, we, like getting both of them is just crazy. These were just dumb. And again, it's in other words, it's like, do you want to double the cost of the most expensive thing in the game? Which is the answer is no. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that's just, uh, they won't look like this. But we're like, yeah, that. Um, yeah, so the secrets are great. We're super, super happy with how they turned out. Production we need to hear the clacking great. sound next to the microphone. Oh, yeah. ASMR, please. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, so then the other cool component we've got here. Oh. Uh, I wonder what this one is. Is that that? I don't like this. Yeah. Okay. And you're probably going to have to pull back a little bit. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get it. Oh, actually, it's perfect. Is oh, that, no, pull uh, back, pull back. Just, just pull right. forward? Back. There's like some funny glare. Yeah. I don't know. Surely it'll just refocus. Oh, oh, okay. This is silly. Um, so I'll also, these are the, the favorite coins, which stack. They've got ridges for stacking. They stack really well. Um, we're, we're again like not 100% sure on size here. They might get a little bit bigger. We'll see. The camera really wants to see back here. Yeah, oh, there we go. oh, I see. There we go. Excellent. Um, one thing about I, I love about these, uh, those ridges enable you to hold them at like a 45 degree angle and they won't slide off, which is useful because a lot of times in the game there are like little stacks of money and you need to compare sums uh, when you're doing counting. Um, they are three millimeter thick, they have a wash on them, uh, and right now they're like a little bit bigger than a nickel. Uh, they may go up to quarter size, it's like not really sure. We have a, That's like one of those... Figuring out exactly how big these components are is like the, the stage of the project that we're at. Uh, mm -hmm. They work really well at this size, and we're just gonna, you know, we'll, we'll just see what we can what we can get away with. Yeah, uh, secrets are also magic. Magic has turned into secrets. Oh yeah, sorry, magic has turned into secrets. Yep. That's true. Magic has turned into secrets, and then um, just rename everything is good. Everybody's kind of digging it. Also, like with the coins, people are not capturing. We're not getting all the detail. There's still oh so gosh. much it's, detail on these coins. Yeah, I, I don't. Well, here we go. I'm gonna do something that probably won't work, but I'm just gonna get it. 
Maybe. Oh, yep, yep. No, that works. Oh, you can see. Yeah, there's like the little runes on the outer edges. Yeah, of they're, they're, so, like, they're like outer. It's awesome. Kyle has done so much detail on these coins. It's insane. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I mean, this is like we want these coins for us are like. I want them to, to be seen. It. Pull back a little. Yeah. Uh, Send it right over to the box. There we go. Come on. Oh, come on. Chicky. There you go. Is it? No. No. Not. Oh, so close. It's so far away. Yeah. Well, all right. Yeah, um, close. We really want like you know our the attitude that we've had with with Oath is that this is a crazy project. It's huge. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that every single like little element of it gets a lot of care on our end, and so. When Kyle, I was like, all right, Kyle, like, here's what we need out of a coin. And then when he sent me that schematic, it was just so detailed. And it has all these, like, little subtle, like, winks to other elements of the game. Mm -hmm. And so we really just wanted a thing that is, like, completely cohesive from every side. Yeah. Um, and I, the coin is a good place where you, where you see a lot of that. Oh, well, and there's such a piece of lore of it, too, right? Because it's based off of a chicken farmer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which we can get into lore at I mean, another time. Yeah, that would be a I'm whole gonna, stream. Yeah. The lore, I mean, I think Kyle and I have, like, similar feelings about lore, which is that we put lots of it in the game and most of it is for us and not for you. <laughs> it's for you to find. Yeah, for us to talk about. Um, we already talked about sleeves. Let's see, banners for every factions, are there the same color or different colors and will they have unique designs for the meeples? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, here's what we can do. I'm gonna, my little stage. Okay. Um, same design, different. Are there going to be any more details on the books placed or is the books final? The, the book is pretty final. Pretty final. Yeah, yeah. Um, the problem, so uh, for folks who might like want more out of the out of the books in terms of detail, problem with resin is that you can't have the fine detail that you get out of like a plastic mini. Mm -hmm. So basically, resin you get like something that holds heat, so it's cool or hot, and it makes a good clacking sound, which is really nice. But then you do lose like a little bit of um, of control over the. There you go. So you can see uh, with the war bands, they all the banners have a different icon on them. Yeah, back. pull back a little bit, just a little more. Maybe. Oh, oh, come on, the webcam. There we go. Maybe. Maybe. We gave you a white space. I know. We're set up in the center of the. Well. Yeah, if it, you, well, know, you, you, you get the idea. We get it. <laughs> um, so for uh, we've tried to be very cautious about um, being colorblind friendly. I'm a little colorblind myself, so I, I really try to uh, do good on that count. The palette for the suit colors and the palette for the, the meeple colors is colorblind friendly, and then just just to like you know, it's a belt and suspenders situation. We also have lots of redundant icons, mm -hmm. so that like the fact that all the war bands have their own little icon. It's just an extra underline. We're like, no, these are different. These are your particular pieces. Yeah. Um, kind of want to address this. Uh, we'll mention it in the Kickstarter too, especially when we're closing out. But talking about the delivery of the games going smoothly for this round, um, yeah. we are not going to be using the same fulfillment partner as That's we did right. with Root Underworld, and it has been completely reworked from the inside. Yeah. Um, we will find. Um, our new system will be used for Fort, and so we will be even adapting it even better uh, for when it comes to Oath. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, Root Underworld was at a scale that we had never <coughs> operated, mm -hmm. and there were many lessons learned on the operation side, and on the, I mean, on every side of the company, there were yeah. lessons learned. So, uh, we do have a new, like, a, a, a new kind of fulfillment system and set of partners, and yep. um, I think, uh, just to underline something that Gates said, we're also like soft testing that right now, and then we're gonna be testing it as we use for Fort. So by the time, like Oath won't be the first project that goes through this. That goes through the system. So don't worry about the fulfillment. I think it's gonna go really well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, awesome. Talking about player count with the um, tutorial system, is yes. that gonna be adapted per player count? So uh, that is a great question. Um, the, way it, the way it's built right now is uh, it's built as a four player tutorial if and um, what we've suggested people do, and I'm, I'm like a version behind on this, so if Josh is in the thread, he can answer it better. But uh, what I believe the suggestion is, is if you only have three, including yourself, uh, the player running the game should run the walkthrough for two player positions, and then can kind of like close up that fourth player position and just continue the game. Uh, because uh, most of the game components are like scale free. The, the game doesn't need to be like reset up if you're playing with a different player. Yeah. Uh, in most cases. 
If you're playing with five or six people for a first game, we suggest people pair up or the person running the game doesn't play a player position. So what we found is like that four count basically allowed us to get by with groups of three and then get by with groups of five and six. Um, and if you're playing with, with two, we recommend that each player pick two player positions to kind of just run through just the first couple turns. Um, there, will, there won't be an extended tutorial for the bot just because there isn't like a room for us to build another tutorial. Um, but before you play with the bot, you should run through the, the, the walkthrough anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, I think somebody had missed at the very beginning. You'd mentioned, I think, about a development problem, but I think this was you just reworking and auditing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah so it's not a huge issue. Yeah, yeah, it's not a huge issue. So basically, like, this, the state that I'm at right now, so we are, the game is content complete. Mm -hmm. We have every, so I can, I can show people, sort of, where, well, I don't know. Should we take so, the close-up? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to pull us back to here? <laughs> Here we go. We're back okay. to the overhead. So th this is not the, the complete set, but like all of the cards in these boxes, and in fact, this is only about maybe two thirds of them. Yeah, you still have cards over here. Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they're everywhere. There's cards over. I'll clean, I'm going to clean up this mess later. These are all the cards in the game. So like this card, the Witch's Bargain, different from Master of Disguise, different from Land Warden. Um, we're, we're at a point where all every single card in the game exists. All, ba almost all, I have one land card, which I haven't designed yet because I'm saving it, because land cards are really fun to design, and it's my carrot. Um, the bot is very close to being done. All the relics are designed. So we're at a point where like the game is um, content complete. In terms of the systems, so Oath has basically like five or six different systems that operate within it. There's like a cash economy system, there's a military system, there's like a, you know, the relic acquisition system. Um, all of those things intersect with, with each other. And when, when you're building a game, uh, usually you look for the weakest beam and then you tear it out, replace it with a stronger beam, and now there's a new beam that is the weakest beam. And this process can continue forever. <laughs> um, it, it never really goes away. Um, we're at the spot right now where I have, so we basically finished the game, it was pretty much design lock. Um, and now we started doing um, what are called a usability study, where we take the game out to people who have had no role in the testing so far, and we let them play it, and we see how it feels, how it looks. And some problems are fixed, and, and here I should say a problem is like, you know, it, it could be something quite small. It's not really a problem with the design. It's like a problem uh, with like how people understand the game or how you know are people feeling the right way when a certain thing happens um, when when we are going through these usability studies some of the feedback we get we can fix with like a change to an icon but sometimes we see things where it's like oh that this number actually might not be quite right or there's just something a little wrong with this so what I'm doing as we get into these usability studies then is I'm going through a lot of the systems and being like okay is there a way that we can do the same thing or something very similar with fewer rules or change the emotional impact a little bit. Uh, and so currently I, I'm doing that for some of the, some of the numbers around the combat system. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's just part of the, the, the due course. Like there's nothing like surprising or worrisome about it. Um, and we're mainly doing it because we have development time left. Um, you know, normally when, when I'm looking at the, the development calendar, for any project, especially a project this big, I'm always looking at how many weeks do I have left to sort of like spend auditing and working on the systems and just making sure everything is perfectly tight. Well, Oath, Oath's development has gone very smoothly. And so it just turned out that I had a little bank of time left. And so this is a thing that I'm doing with that time. Mm -hmm. And speaking about time, I know we'll go into this on the Kickstarter update too, but uh, talking about our timeline for mm -hmm. Oath right now, we're pretty, pretty young. We're a little long. We, we are we are very. There are some slight. We have some slight delays. Um, some of them are related to COVID. Some of them are just related to the fact that um, we wanted to like change the board art somewhat mm -hmm. dramatically and do some things like that. So we are currently looking at finishing all of the art and all the assets for the game in late August. We had hoped to be doing finishing it in like late July. So we're like about. I mean, if you think about everything that's happened in this year. From like the yeah. uprising in Minneapolis to the pandemic to the pandemic version two, um, we're about a month behind. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy with how the, the team's done yeah. on this. We've all like 
everyone's stuck together, everyone's doing a really good job. Um, but I mean, it, it was so, you know, when we, the, the week that we were supposed to re return home from the pandemic was when the uprising began yeah. in, in, in Minneapolis, which delayed us from coming back to work for about for a month. Week. Yeah, yeah. yeah for, for a while. Thanks, so, yeah. Um, and you know, that, that kind of stuff is still going on. So all those things, I, I think, you know, we had initially said, I think on the Kickstarter that we would have the project uh, fulfilling in January. I think that's probably gonna be closer to February, March. I'm not 100% sure yet, but I think, I mean, out of everything that, that has happened <laughs> since then, it seems like a pretty small delay. Uh, usually I, I like to finish these products early if I can, but in this case with the project, especially of this scope, we just really wanted to take our time. And uh, when I have better, um, when I have better ex exact, I mean, what will probably happen, I should say, is that when we do the final file submission, we will have the revised timeline, yeah. which could drift a little bit from the, the initial timeline, but it's nothing dramatic. Yeah. I mean, I think like, you know, when, when I look at the things that are have yet to be finished before the game is like totally ready for the factory, finishing in a couple months is not a, is not a problem. And we'll have this written down in the Kickstarter update yep. too, always. Um, and then, oh, Kyle, it doesn't take forever to finish anything. Yeah, uh, so yeah, art's not final. That was another thing. Um, top favorite cards. You mentioned favorite those? cards, yes. I want to talk about favorite cards. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna go by suit. And these are all in the extended deck. Okay, so we'll go by. So it means you have to play like after you play your first game. You will yeah, see I, I have a lot of the cards that I like in the the starting deck, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about them because people have already seen them. Um, okay, so we'll do order first. Uh, yeah, this card's hilarious. So this is the I guess I put it here, but I'll just ooh well, yeah. I'll just read it because I don't have the actual art piece for this yet. Mm -hmm. uh, the palanquin, which uh, spend no supply of traveling from a site you rule to another. Uh, yeah, sorry. You don't spend any actions if you're traveling from a place you rule as long as there's another pawn there, but they go with you. So basically you have someone carry you to the site where you want to go. Love this card. It's hilarious. That was a, that was a Josh Yearsley original, that card. Um, silly. Very yeah, silly. so there's a lot of some, there's some silly stuff. Uh, I really like Tyrant. Um, Tyrant is um, has a lock on it in the bottom. I guess it's has a lock on it in the, the bottom right, which means once you play Tyrant, uh, you can never get rid of it. It also goes in your personal cohort. Uh, whenever you have the Tyrant up, you whenever you walk anywhere, you have to kill a piece at the site you walk to. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there's no enemies there, you have to kill your own pieces. So it, you just, you're always making people mad, you're always stomping around. Um, very silly, very silly card. Okay, that, that was Order. Uh, order, a lot of the Order cards are all about ruling, and so they like create laws, like there's a curfew card not very topical, um, which uh, stops players from like performing trades at, at sites you rule. So oh. like, it's like an after dark type thing. Nice. Know, watch out. Um, okay, so then this card has uh, some a lot more words on it than the usual card. It's a four liner. Um, I think there's a new wording that actually uh, lowers the, the, the word count here. One of the very fun like last minute introduction. Uh, yeah, sorry, let me restart that. So in terms of development, one of the things we just finished was auditing the five and six player games. And I was a little like worried about this because I had played so much Oath at three and four players. I just didn't, I was kind of worried about downtime. And what we found, because I have mixed feelings, I was worried about downtime and game state entropy. So how crazy is the game? Is what Can I plan if the board state is changing completely from one um, turn to the next? What we found was uh, downtime's not really an issue. It, the, the, the turn length, once you've played a couple games, that's the key qualifier, underline, doubles, double underline. Once you've played a couple games, the amount of time you spend on your turn is about half that or two thirds that of a root turn. So if you can play root with five, you can play oath with five, easy. Mm -hmm. So the downtime's not really a big issue. And entropy isn't a big issue. Uh, the adjustments that we made for the five and six player game are very, very small. Uh, basically, uh, the banks in the game start with a little bit more money. And then the other thing that, that we included, and this is actually true of all accounts, is we created um, just, we fleshed out the rules about negotiation and kind of encouraged players to do it. And one of the rules that we added, which I really like, is a rule that says if an exile wins, they can accept petitions of citizenship from other exiles. So why would an exile want to do this? Well, if you crafted a little kingdom, 
and some doofus wins on like a vision and they don't have anything that's going to carry over to the next game, you can offer them your kingdom and say, hey, I will be a citizen of the next game mm-hmm. if you carry over this. And what you're doing is you're kind of like creating this weird informal alliance where you're like, you know, let's kind of work together. I, I, I'll accept your petition of citizenship if, if, if I win and if you accept mine when you win. And then, and our beef we'll deal with in game two. And so to bolster that, and it isn't a shared victory, one player wins still, that's very important, but to bolster that we've included some cards that give players the ability to negotiate. So one of them is this card right here, which is the Deed Rider. The Deed Rider allows you to negotiate any deal which uh, involves a transfer of favor and secrets and the control of land. So what we've done is we've built a bunch of these negotiation cards. There's one of them that allows you to buy and sell relics from one another. Uh, there's the Deed Rider, and then there's the Festival District, which lets you uh, trade advisors. So in, in part of this is as we've built up Oath, one of the things I, I, that I've always kept in my, in my crosshairs for the game design is I want the, the game to feel very differently depending on which cards are out. So in certain games, you can imagine the, the game is almost like a Traders of Genoa, like very interactive negotiation game. And if those cards aren't out, it will have a different character. Uh, and one of the cards that jump start, started this, I mentioned this in the last stream, I think, is the Gambling Hall. The Gambling Hall allows players to dice for cash. And it is hilarious. And it basically puts a little push your luck game inside Oath. And in games when the Gambling Hall is out, it completely changes the economic calculus of the game in ways that are surprising and fun and they, they change how players think about the other systems. And so what I wanted were more cards like Gambling Hall. Not necessarily that were random, but that by that single card's existence within the game, a whole other things are possible, right? And uh, we had a very good moment in a game that we played last week where um, someone uh, had the succession condition. They were this, a citizen, they looked like they were going to win, and the chancellor exiled them. And they were able to go to the Tinker's Fair and then buy the Proof of Nobility from another player, which is a relic that allows them to buy their way back in, into the, the, the Commonwealth. And so that kind of like really emergent storytelling has been really amped up lately. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's, I'm gonna, I can talk about these cards all day. That was, gonna, the, that was a hearth card, right? That was a hearth card. I'm gonna go sure. pretty fast through the next ones. Um, do, do, do. Oh, this one's easy. I love the Dream Thief. Uh, this is an arcane card. Um, the action, it's an expensive action, but you just swap any two advisors. So any two advisors uh, that are face down. So you don't know what you're swapping, but if like one player has a face down vision and another player has a face down something, you can use the Dream Thief to just swap those two cards. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great, and when it's out, it forces players to not keep their cards face down, which mm. changes like how many secrets you can hold when the Dream Thief's in play. Um, yeah. These are really good cards. No wonder they're your favorite. Yeah, the other ones are good too. <laughs> How uh, many cards are currently? There are 198 denizen cards and 21 relics okay. and uh, 24 sites, and they're all unique. Yeah. Um, uh, so the relics, uh, the way uh, this is the relic thief. Um, the way relics work in the game is you can buy them. Uh, you can you can you can recover them from sites by going and like you know spending the resources the relic asks you to spend. Uh, you can also take them from people. Uh, the Relic Thief introduces a third way of getting relics, which is you can steal them from each other, and you have to dice for them. It, 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 like, it falls into the like turning the game a little bit into a push-your-luck game. Um, also, uh, th- this is a card I quite like too, Insomnia, um, which will make you unpopular. You have to burn favor out of the game to use Insomnia, but you gain action points. Mm. So you become uh, very busy, busy and yep. lot less popular. All right, those are Discord. We got two suits left, I think. I'm just take. What I'm literally doing is taking a random handful of cards. And what your favorite one is and from the handful. And then I'm just picking my favorite one from the handful. Because how do you pick up all 190 yeah, children? Yeah, yeah, there's like, like the not. Um, so, oh, this is a good one. So I'll, I'll go do a couple orders, uh, a couple no man cards. Uh, the Oracle allows you to look through the deck for the next vision and just pull it, so we get fast vision access. Very nice. Um, there's another good. Nomad card uh, that does things with visions called Sacred Ground. I think it's sitting in the other room though. Where when the Sacred Ground is in play, it's a sight only card, it's permanent, and you have to reveal visions while you're at the Sacred Ground. So you can't just like reveal a vision. You have to go to the Sacred Ground and you reveal it there. Uh, And it's another one of those cards that like 
changes the feeling of the game when it's in play. Uh, okay, uh, Ryan is up. starting to suggest oath booster packs. Not going to happen, man. No, <laughs> not going to yeah, happen. I'm, I, I'm ready to go back to work on Root now. Um, for so this one's really true. I'm just uh, let's see. We'll do. I want. I actually have a very specific. Uh, just to answer this question, nope. there is going to be custom sleeves for every piece card, of card. Every card that we give you. Anything that's that considered you, a card. Anything that gets shuffled will have a sleeve. We and, won't sleeve the books or the cards. Well, no, <laughs> so the reason I'm making that yeah. distinction is because yeah, I don't know if we're going to do sleeves for, like, the tutorial nope. cards. No. Because, like, there's just not, I mean, it's silly. We shouldn't destroy our planet to sleeve a tutorial card. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, hot take. Uh, okay, so one thing is, um, I'll show this card. This is ro ro uh, the Roving Terror. Um, folks might remember this card as the Terror when uh, for, for the, with this art piece. Uh, back when it was just the Terror, it was used to steal favor from other suits, so but good. it just like didn't really fit the art. And what we did was we renamed a card called Migration, which. Um, the way this card works is you spend a secret and you just you kill a card somewhere else on the board and then this card travels there, so it's like a roving monster. Um, what we found was that migration was a very like science textbooky name for a card power that was actually like a rampaging monster, and roving terror. We already had our image for the rampaging monster. So one of the things that I haven't really talked about too much is we have taken. Um, the names through several um, editorial passes mm -hmm. just to try to strengthen the, the storytelling. And I, I have a general rule when I, when I when I talk to Kyle about the art, which is if he looks at a card power and he looks at the name and he doesn't really know what the card does or why it's interesting, it probably has a bad name. Mm -hmm. And then that, that's a good reason to, uh, to, to review it. Yeah. Um, so there are a couple kind of funny uh, other beast cards I want to highlight. One of them is the Vow of Poverty, which... Um, if you're broke, wait, no, sorry, this is the Vow of Union, which is a little different. Is that so, the official art for it, too? That's no. one of my favorite pieces. Uh, no, that art is not, now belongs to a card called True Names, which you pick a suit, and the opponent may not use battle plans of that suit. Uh, so you get to, like, cut through their, their command. I love this piece of art, too. Um, so the, the Vow of Union um, changes how you play very dramatically. So the Vow cards, the way they work is when you take a Vow, you're stuck with so it has a little lock on it. It goes on your, your personal board. And uh, the Vow of Union has this effect where you don't really have a cohort anymore. All of your cards are kind of like, all of your cohorts are like in one, all of your warbands are like in one cohort. And so like you, it's like hive mind. Uh, th there's another funny one. Um, there is, oh, I can't remember the name of it, but there's another Vow in the Nomad suit where you pay all your money to the Nomad Bank and then for the rest of the game, you use the Nomad Bank instead of your personal bank. Mm -hmm. So other people can take from it or add to it or whatever, and that just kind of builds it. Or there's a Vow, I think in Hearth, which is like the Vow of Peace, which doesn't let you attack. But then it makes other people harder. It's, other, it's harder for other people to attack you, but mm -hmm. you don't attack anymore. Um, so anyway, just uh, some little card preview. Sorry about that. I could talk a lot about, about, the these, about these cards. Um, another, I think, good question is with playtesting and development, how many, um, what are we calling a segment of a chronicle? How many games of a chronicle, right? What, what do you mean? I'm so, sorry, like, yeah. How many games are you expecting people to play in one campaign? But oh, sure. We have so, a whole, it's called Chronicle, right? It, yeah, it's, whole, it, okay. yeah it, it's, it is the Chronicle. Um, this, the, the game is designed so that there is no limit. It never has to start over. Um, I have seen Chronicles now, I've seen three Chronicles that have gotten past like 25 generations. Um, personally, I, I, so I, I think, you know, in the rules, the way the rules work is the rules will tell you how to continue your Chronicle. If you want a factory, if you want to restart it and go back to like factory default, you mm -hmm. can. Or you can just kind of keep playing it. The game's designed to, to, to work either way. Um, personally, I think I would probably, if I were starting a new group on mm -hmm. the game, I would probably restart just for the fun of building the story from, oh, yeah. from the beginning. So like I have a I have a small like gathering I do with my friends every year and I could imagine us grabbing Oath and playing like four or five games in a weekend. I would probably start the game from scratch or do a random seed. And we might include rules to do a random seed. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that is a really the correct way to say it at all. Yeah. To do a randomized yes. start. So like if you We're using seed because of TTS, because of tabletop simulator. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Um, because if you wanted to, instead of just starting with like a factory default chronicle, you could just shuffle everything. It, mm -hmm. It'd be a lot of work. You probably don't want to do that. And then you, you can you can start from a complete a complete random set. Um, one thing I'll I'll say about that too is that the, the way the product is designed, the way the game is designed. It's actually easier to just continue a chronicle than to reset things. Mm -hmm. So, like, it's not more work to do the work of, of, of the chronicle phase. Like, that's just tear down. So you yeah. might you might as well do it. And um, yeah, so I, I think you know it's going to be up to, up to your up to your group. If you find that that the setting veers away from the kinds of things you want to do in the game, you can restart. Or uh, what I would what I'd more recommend is that you try to fight your way back to the to the elements of the game that you want to be highlighted. Yeah. Uh, another question, can people transfer their Chronicles from kit B to kit C, or are we... Uh, you can, because, so the reason why you could do this, this is a, uh, I did not anticipate this question. W with respect to the TTS mod, if you're playing on the TTS mod, your seed that you use, your code... That very long... Yeah, the very long, you know, like maybe 200 characters. We sometimes drop them in our streams. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that will work from kit B to kit C. Like that same seed should work just fine. Um, if you were going from a physical kit, or if you wanted to go from like a digital kit to a physical one, well, that's that's harder. But so mm -hmm. I'm not going to worry about that question. <laughs> um, but all of the card list has been stabilized, yeah. so you could just write down the card IDs and then yeah. resort it and build it that way. But if you're playing on TTS, that seed will work in kit C. Yeah. Okay. And actually, it should even work in the published version. Um, are there going to be icons on the cards that mark them as starter cards? Uh, no, that's a reasonable thing to ask for, though. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, the first fifty-four cards. I think what we what we could do is just do a numbering guide, so yeah. that like some little block, there'll be a little block of text maybe in the rules that'll say like, "Hey, cards one through fifty-four are starting." You know. Yeah. Archive one, archive two. Put an icon on this. Or you put an icon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I see. Yeah, I see where you're at though. Yeah, yeah, if it's one through fifty-four. It's one through fifty-four. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's 54. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, Swiss Case was asking about the... Cool. Question for Gates. Is there a set date for the end late patch period on Kickstarter? We're going to be announcing that on this Thursday. Um, just because of the delay with everything, we want to be able to give everyone uh, enough amount of time for their card charge date. So Thursday, I promise we will have a day for you. Um, also, back to the sleeves... When yes. will we have details about like whether they're matte or glossy? That's a great question. Probably soonish. Okay. Like, and by soon, I mean like in a month. Month. Yeah. 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 It is something we're talking about. We're looking at the options. Yeah, because we have to We've figure out like. So we have to figure out for the sleeves, for instance. So this is the actual card back. This is the legit card back. Um, I'm looking for a vision card. There's one. So here's the vision. Put that there, and there is the denizen. Um, for the sleeve art, we're not sure exactly what we're going to do. We could do like a gold border, we could just do the white border, we could do the full image, we're not sure. It's going to depend on a lot of things, um, and as soon as we lock on to that product, we'll let everybody know exactly what it's going to be, so there are no surprises. But everything that's shuffled will have a sleeve, I extra promise. Mm, let's see, and Nick, since he's in the office right next to us, what's your favorite type of world to play in? Discord, Order, Nomad. I like, ooh, well, mm, I like the Discord worlds the best. They're the, they're like all the most game breaky, wild. It's like maybe a step too close to flux for most people, but I love it. Yes. Um. Also, let's just put the card backs on the closed camera here. A lot of people want to look at. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Oh, and actually, I've got this. I even got oh, no. this thing for this very purpose. I will say that like I like to be an exile in an order world because there are the most rules. And so, like, it feels the most like I'm in exile. Like, you really yeah. feel on the outside of things. Okay, there's a little bit of a glare. Um... <laughs> <laughs> cool. You know, I'm going to say that it's a pass. And then draw it back, draw it back. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I'm sorry. We're, we're trying. I think, like, so, you know... I love the feeling when you're in exile, I love the feeling of a powerful chancellor, like you're going to lose and many forces conspiring against you. You get that when you're fighting in a world that's very order heavy. 
as a chancellor, I love the feeling of everything slipping away out of my control, and you get that the most. There's a lot of Discord cards. Are you going to fix it? I'm going to get this camera. Oh. Let's see. I don't know. Oh, oh boy. Maybe. Oh, I think we're there. Ish. We're almost there. Ish. We're, we're good. Kyle, you can post those pictures to Twitter. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> Kyle, yeah. Post the pictures to the Twitter. But it's great. We get the image. Um, yeah, so we are up on an hour here. If we want to ask any final thing, <laughs> Kyle, art is blurry on purpose. <laughs> uh, photo is accurate. Any final questions? Oh, hold on. Sorry, fast. Uh, but can the bot substitute a player in a higher player game, like a five or six player game? Uh, you, you wouldn't want to do that, no. <laughs> just, you, just, you just don't. So, like... Yeah, it, you, you wouldn't want to do it. They're I, not going to work. The bot's not going to work like how Clockwork works for Root. It's not going to work how Clockwork works. That That's that's it's thing great, one. Yeah. And thing two is, like, I think um, the, the, the bot is... is a, so... Bots are stupider than players, and that's that's no put down on bots, but they yeah. are. And so, in order to compensate for their stupidity, you need to make them a little bit stronger. Mm -hmm. This is just this is just true of like AI design generally. <laughs> um, and you just you don't want that in your. F if you've got four players, play Oath with four. You don't want a bot mucking around. No. Um, it won't yeah, get your think, experience. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think that like the at low player count. So okay. To make the bot, I'll get into the weeds here. To make the bot stronger, you have to, part of that strength comes from chaos, right? You got you make it a little more chaotic and wily. But at a high at a high player count, there's already a lot of like ambient wiliness. In a low player count game, it could use some ambient wiliness. Mm -hmm. So like a bot can work very well in two and three players yeah. and be like not very interesting in a high player count game. And an example of that, like I sometimes get this question about Wakan, which is the bot designed for Pax Premier. Mm -hmm. You could technically use it in a high player count game, but you... I you, wouldn't want to. Yeah, but you wouldn't want to. Like, yeah. the, the bot is not going to be adding anything at that count. Whereas it works great with one and two players. Yeah. Um, Two-player game requires bot? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. I was originally, like, my original plan was to make a very firm ruling on this, so I didn't have a lot of, like, squirrely variants that I had to deal with. Mm -hmm. But I kind of like Oath as a two-player game. It has, like its own character. Yeah. With the bot it works and it's cool. But it also kinda works without the bot, so it may end up being like a premiere situation That's where what it I'm just to say. you just leave it up to players. Like if you want like a kind of tense tete a tete, you can just play without the bot. Yeah. Or if you want something that feels more like a three or four player game, put the bot in there. Yeah. Good. Has the bank system become a little less relevant with the people's favor being purchasable? It's a great question. Uh, no. So the bank system is uh, it is a very important omnipresent pressure on the game. The, the suits that have money are the suits that are going to get solicitations. And the ones that don't uh, are going to have trouble. And so with the People's Favor game, so this is a very funny here, I'll put the People's Favor out here. Um, this is uh, an, actually put it over there. Oh yeah, put it over here. Yeah. This is an old People's Favor, I think, and I'm, a, I'm just sorry. Uh, oh, it's, oh. Auto focuses uh, on guys. Okay. okay. Um, so don't worry too much about the people's favor. That is a very uh, is a very drafty layout. Um, mm -hmm. I don't even know if this version is the version from this kit. Yeah. Um, but it's Patty fine. is doing phenomenal with the graphics. Design. Patty's doing amazing. And actually, one thing I love about the, we have these beautiful braids on all the cards now. Patty's been doing great. Um, so the people's favor. What you're trying to do is you're buying it with favor, like. The actually, it's a weirdly a place where it's more like kit A than like kit B. Like there, there's this thing that you buy with favor and you, in order to buy it, you need to spend more favor on it. So where do you get that favor? We're gonna get the favor from the banks, except the average bank is gonna have like three, two to three favor in it. And the people's favor will start going in, in a game around the people's favor, will start going for like five or six favor in the mid and late game. So how do you get that favor? Well, you have to do the same kind of portfolio management that was in the court game, or sorry, not the court game, but was in the, the popular support game of Kit B, where you need to find the right advisors, you need to chase the, the money flow, you need to figure, find ways of directing the, the money flow to the banks that you have access to. So the banks end up being very relevant. They're just not part of the, like, they aren't part of the victory calculation. They're part of the strategic calculation. 
That's the better answer. That's the, that's, that's the simpler and sure <laughs> answer. Previously, you had to count the banks up all the time mm -hmm. to make the victory calculation, which is why it got so tiring. Now, they're an important element of your personal strategy, but you don't have to look at them at all when it comes to figuring out, can I win the game? Or have I won the game, maybe? Um, people are asking about the complexity. I know that we've talked about like one and a half root faction for mm -hmm. complexity. Are we still there? Yep, yep. I, I would say uh, it's one and a half to two root factions. If speaking in terms of the law of root, uh, the core rules for this game are five pages long. Yeah. Now that that doesn't seem very long, but th that's like in a legal style. Um, I think that uh, this game. I think I would pro well. It's not terribly more complicated than root, mm -hmm. but it is a lot more open, mm -hmm. and by that same token, less forgiving than root is. So for a certain type of group, this is going to be the better play than something like Root. But any, any group that can play Root or can play Terraforming Mars or Gloomhaven or whatever, you can easily play Oath. Oath so and actually, uh, someone asked me the other day of comparing Oath's rules to Gloomhaven's rules. Gloomhaven is like twice as complicated. Yeah. Or three <laughs> times, it's like three times as complicated as Oath. Yeah. But Oath is a lot harder to play. Because in Gloomhaven... Strategically, yes. Yeah, strategically. In, yes. in Gloomhaven, you know... And, and, uh, it, there's it's no shit. There's just different styles of games. In Gloomhaven, yeah. you know what victory looks like. Victory involves you getting the object you need, beating the monsters you need to beat. There's know. a clear objective. There's a clear I'm... objective. You don't know if you're going to make it. Yeah. But like you, there, there's a, like, you, you know that if you kill a bugbear on this turn, you're going to be one step closer on yeah. the next turn. The clock is very obvious in yeah. Gloomhaven, where and the clock is defined by several different things. Yeah, there, and, and in Oath, even experienced players sometimes will get their starting hands in Oath and be like, I have no idea how to, what I need to do. Same. Yeah. And that, that, is a, that is a normal and even like a good thing. Yeah. So if you like games that are going to be constantly challenging your strategic assumptions... We, we got you. And, and, and the game isn't, in terms of the rules, it's just not that hard. Um, there are, and in fact, many of the places where the rules are tricky right now are getting like mm -hmm. polished and sanded. So the rules, the rules, I wouldn't be surprised if the rules get a little bit shorter rather than getting longer. Yeah. I think I played, I played right after the relics got in. Mm -hmm. And I purposely haven't played in a, no, I didn't play at all until yeah. then. So I'm in the same place. Like, I followed Oath because I have to, right? Yeah. So going into it, I, I still had a good, a good idea about what to do, but there was those periods of time where it's like the learning curve of like, oh, I need to learn what steps I need to take. Yeah. And it, I would say it was around the same rounds that I needed that for Root, but it was in a different, yeah. it was a different complexity. Yeah, it was just root, hard to define. Like Root gets wild as players get a lot more experience with yep. it. Uh, this game starts wild. Wild, yes, and then absolutely. It, and it gets like, it really goes off the rails once the world starts developing. Yeah. Um, but yeah. You're not just going to play the game once either. So. Yeah. Uh, who's the best player in the office? I think we've been talking Patty it's in the Patty. chat. It's Patty. It's definitely Patty. <laughs> Patty, like, here's how good of, a, of an Oath player Patty is. Patty hadn't played for like three or four weeks. And I, I get back <laughs> in the office, we're all like, you know, adjusting to office life again. And I'm like, all right, Patty, we got a seat for you. Come play with us. It's, mm -hmm. it's been a while. It's time, and Patty. There's a bunch of rules. Don't worry, your reputation's not going to be on the line. This is like just a just an average game. Uh, and she just cold won, like a completely dominating yeah. win. She's incredible. She just knows like she knows when to get out of people's way mm -hmm. and to let people fall over themselves. So, that's yeah. the, it's oh, like, that's uh, so important. Yeah, no, she like she just she doesn't stop people from making errors. What is yeah. that famous? Uh, I think it's a Napoleonic quote where he was like, "Don't interrupt your enemy while they're making it." Yep. That is that is Pat. It seems like that's Patty's strategic <laughs> mo, and it works to great effect. Okay, uh, Kyle, there needs to be a Patty Napoleon photo yeah. now. Um, there was a little bit of conversation about king making. I don't know if we want to go into that. Sure, I can okay. go into it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So oath. I mean, I've uh, written and talked and thought a lot about t uh, king making. Oath is in a lot of ways like a game about kingmaking, and I I can kind of summarize my feelings about it, which is um, kingmaking is a little bit about what we expect a game to do. So because we're expecting the best player to win a game, mm -hmm. um, it feels wrong when someone like 
pushes them across the, the victory line because yeah. we were all independent players. Mm -hmm. How is it fair that two players are working together and then one player is being validated in their strategy? Yeah. Now, part of the reason why it feels so wrong is because games are in this very weird like temporal space where they, they finish and clean up and then it's over and we just like go to the, we have a Crokinole winner's board in the office yeah. where after a game of Crokinole people will mark who won. Um, and that treats every game of Crokinole as like an, an episode that can be connected to any other game. It's just like yeah. a single test that you're either passing or failing. Mm -hmm. Oh, this I like that though. Because the manner in which a player wins is actually much more important than who won. And so because of the stakes of victory and oath, uh, kingmaking takes on a very different feeling. Because if you kingmake, you are participating in the shape that the world is taking. Mm -hmm. And it's what, what, what I found personally is players who are normally quite turned off by the idea of kingmaking uh, find it's completely permissible in Oath because I'm behaving in a certain way because this bit of land that I've been cultivating, mm -hmm. I want to persist. And everyone's still trying to win, everyone's still trying to be the main person driving everything, um, but it allows players to work together in ways that are really fruitful and interesting. I mean, what, one of the things that I say about, uh, that I've talked about kingmaking before, is that when we're playing a game, it's very important that every player tries to win. Uh, that's as important as all the players in a play uh, working off the same script. Uh, we've agreed about what we're going to value, and if we disagree on those values, then the game kind of falls apart. With uh, that said, there are still moments where uh, a king-making gesture in a game like a Game of Thrones can feel so thematic and so perfect that it actually, if the game is about immersion and storytelling, it can be this really transcendent moment. But you have to be careful because it could also be a moment that takes people out mm -hmm. of, of, of play. And so I actually think that Euros um, are often guilty of this. Like if you're losing in Great Western Trail and you're like, well, I just want to get all the brown horses. Yeah. And now other players can't, like, like that ends up helping another player win because you just kept buying all the brown horses because yeah. that was your like sub goal. That is as dangerous a king-making move as a player helping somebody win a game of, of diplomacy. So the way I tend to judge kingmaking is, did it heighten the narrative power of the game? Mm -hmm. And if it did, then I'm, I, I think I'm kind of okay with that. In Oath, in, in Oath, when we see that kind of player cooperation, it does heighten the, whole, heighten the whole experience. And so I've kind of leaned into it a little bit, which is just another way of saying, like, this game is not for everybody. Yeah. And there's no sense in pretending it is. And there's a lot of king making. Like if you go back and watch the uh, Space Cats and Peace Turtle streams, because that's their bread and butter, yeah. being TI, like you see a lot more of that happening. I think mm -hmm. so. Like it won't naturally come. Like you can no, force no. you can force it to happen. Yeah, like the, anything else. The, 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 there's no mechanism. And I would say, yeah. like m more game. Like th there's a reason why Patty keeps winning all of our games. Both. She's a very good oath player. Yeah. Um, and you know. I, I do feel like I have I have met and played with better and worse oath players. I don't even know really where I fall on the spectrum. I think I'm like s slightly above average in my oath play. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the game rewards planning and um, and rewards good play and is interesting. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't feel like capricious king making or anything like that. Yeah. Um. This person is asking questions about uh, is. The Law of Oath going to be called the Law of Oath? Or Probably. Is it just work? Okay, because it was just interesting. Uh, since we have people usurping each other in the game, is it appropriate to have the Law of Oath when the political climate in the ch game is actually changing? It's actually not like a single book of laws, wrong. right? Well, yeah. it's like the, what are the, what are the, the, the Law of Rome, right? The, the Tables of Oath, Yeah, Rome, right? we can There's, do ta the Tables of Oath. Yeah, the Tables of Oath. Oh, well, we can take the Tables of funny, Eternity. It's a funny thing, I feel like... Words. Is the lesson about the Roman law tables that like they weren't really written? No, I'm thinking about the, no. the British Constitution. Yeah. It's the thing that doesn't exist, right? So maybe it's the Constitution of Oath, right? Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> but like it is. Uh, so the, the, in addition to to pairing or maybe the Code of Oath, something like a little loose. The problem is the Law of Oath is the only thing in the game that is stable, yeah. <laughs> right? So like actually it is kind of it's supposed to be an immutable law. Yeah. Um, I just yeah thought it was interesting how we use words. Josh, Josh usually Josh usually. <laughs> This one. Um, let's see. How likely is it that the same person will just keep winning and winning? Uh, we're talking about Patty winning a lot. Yeah. So uh, it's funny that, that Patty has won a lot, but she wins a lot in a lot of different positions. She actually won a game recently as 
as an exile, started as a chancellor, and then didn't feel like playing chancellor the next time we sat down to play, and so I took the chancellor position. I think she won as an exile in the next game. Um, so she didn't even play as her carried on as, roles. Yeah, yeah. So she actually switched roles, and it, it didn't matter. Um, or and I, if she didn't win, maybe Marshall won that. I think Marshall might have won that second game. Anyway, I can't remember exactly. Um, what will happen sometimes is that, like, there's actually an interesting thing about this. Commonwealths will so I, I've seen Commonwealths last for like six games. So this is like either a chancellor or a citizen is winning for six games in a row. Mm. And that's fine. That is a dominant position. It means the board is going to be a lot more stable. And it also means that the exiles might need to start working together a little bit and finding some common ground if they want to try to take down a big empire. Sometimes, in fact, one of the things I really like about this game is sometimes someone will win in like a dirty way. Like they'll get a little lucky and then, yeah. you know, They'll, they'll get like lucky twice in a row, and it will like spell into a win. And in the next game, people are like, "Okay, we're gonna tear this thing apart." Like you don't get to build an empire that easily. And I'm just kind of lean into that. I mean, I really, um, as a player personally, I avoid any kind of metagaming. Don't like it. I want to play the game as like seriously and honestly, and like close off the. Re- I mean, it's, you have a hundred and ninety card deck. No I know, metagaming. I know. What are you talking I know, about? I know, I know. But but uh, you know. For me, I like. I really think we, we build a magic circle. This is the game that's being played. <laughs> I want to like study and think about the game, which is why I don't really the present. Yeah. I don't very much even like games that have randomized setups. Normally, sure. I like things that are stable. Uh, this game has none of those things, and so it's and so for that reason, it cannot help be a, about meta gaming. I just kind of sure. lean into all those areas of you know discomfort. Mm-hmm. They'll be guides. They'll be out there. Um, let's see. We were talking compared to root, how long does it take for a group of players to really feel out the dimensions of oath? I think we kinda answered that but not yeah, as directly. It's like uh well Honestly, like first game I felt good. The second game is when I would feel like I could actually compete. Yeah, it, it's like really like things really start I think usually by the end of the first game. Yeah. Depending on how long the game went, you'll have a pretty good sense of how the game works. And then in the second game you're like, Okay, I wanna try this. Yeah. And then it definitely Oath has that character too where Sometimes you'll see a player win a game in a really strange way, mm-hmm. and then next game you're like, "All right, I want to try what they did," which is a very like that's a, I always associate that with like Princess of Florence or something, mm-hmm. where you're like, maybe you didn't realize how good um, like the park strategy or something. Yeah, you know what I mean, or not, not that, that's not a thing. Um, Princess of Florence, like you know, a strategy where you go like lots of low value works as opposed to like the big works. Mm-hmm. But I haven't thought about Princess of Florence in a long time. Um, <laughs> And so the next game, you're like, oh, I'm going to try that. Or I'm going to like run the, the only gesture strategy or whatever. So uh, I, in general, though, I think by the end of the second game, you should be pretty comfortable with most of the things that Oath can throw at you, and then you just got to hold on. There's still going to be so much being thrown at you versus Root, though. Oh, like, yeah. It's yeah. Always, you're always going to have to walk into the experience knowing that it's open. And there's going to be things you're going to see. Any other yeah, and I have um, one other funny thing about that. Um, the, uh, the search action in this game, which is how you draw cards... <laughs> is a pretty bad action. Like, you're not advancing your game position when you draw cards. But what you are doing is saying, hey, um, I need help. I don't know how to win. And maybe there's a way to win. And even, like, even the, the game's core development team, like when myself and Josh and Nick and, like, Patty or something, when we're playing the game, and, and we've, like, worked on all these cards, we have a very good sense of the deck list, sometimes we don't know what to do. And we'll say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to draw three random cards from the deck. And every once in a while, you'll get a card and be like, oh, this is actually exactly the card I need. Mm -hmm. And like the whole game changes from that moment. So the the search function in this game, and this is something I'm really proud of how how the design turned out. Um, You don't like search your way to victory. Uh, You don't really want to do that. Like the search action is for players who are doing badly or who need an option. And then sometimes they find it, and it's and it's a kind of remarkable thing that happens. And it's it's pretty common. I see that happen in a lot of playtesting reports too. Mm-hmm. Um, I think kind of other one. This one's been asked a little bit. Uh, any interest in having pre-made maps or scenarios? Um, nope. The no. game generates them. Yeah. 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 I think that's like yeah, that's far off. If we would do no. Yeah, I, I also <laughs> think that like, like, like that's marketing that I part of about. yeah, like like part of the fun of the of the engine is that it generates those scenarios yeah. with a lot of narrative uh, coherence, and so like this is actually why I'm not going to release like a lot of lore stuff. 
yeah. about the game. I'm like, I'm not really interested. So much in of it's already that. there. To yeah, and I and I want I want it, it to be. Um, I really want the players to have to build out the lore and to like tell me the stories about you know the roving mm-hmm. captain or whatever. And like, kind of. I I, I think they're gonna they're gonna be in the driver's seat when it comes to that kind of world building. Yeah, and I think like I don't know the perfect marketing world or like just sharing their experiences i would love to see people take pictures of their boards and us tell oh yeah totally. them, them tell us their story rather than us facilitate one well and, and i know that we might you know hopefully we'll be back uh playing with our group soon mm-hmm. and uh but even if you haven't one of the things i love about the tts is that it's so easy to share your world yes i mean you can almost tweet it like you could just oh, yeah. s- send out your world and other people can play from that same seed and so I mean, one of the things that, that I wanted, and I've mentioned this a few times, is the, the people who would run, like, Dwarf Fortress Legacy servers or Minecraft Legacy servers where they just pass the server around. It, to me, it's one of my favorite ways of playing a procedurally generated game is to pass the save file around. Because then you enter a game that has already had a lot of history in it, and you yeah. can keep adding to that story, and it's just wonderful. So I really want, like, you know, the folks who would pass around, like, a RimWorld save mm-hmm. or a Minecraft save, like... I, I want, you know, it, it, I don't know if this will ever happen, but part of the, one of the things in the back of my mind was like a, a world where I have my copy of both and I've played it a dozen times and my brother has his copy of both and now maybe he's played it half a dozen times and we trade copies yeah. and, and we, you know, we, we, we can, we can see them spin out, we can hand it to somebody else. Right. And so I, I just, I think a scenario just isn't going to deliver that. Mm-mm. I want to see a chain of session reports. Do it. Do it. Um, okay. Any potential expansion ideas? We need to sell the game first. Yeah, we have to sell, <laughs> we have to sell the game. I have, I have notes for expansion material. Um, my attitude about Oath is I have never uh, been able to do a project this big. Yeah. This is like as close to a triple A. I mean, I was talking to Patrick about it. The development budget for this game is like in the world of Fantasy Flight which is way outside the punching range of the studio. But it's like, it's huge. We've never done something like this big before. Um, so, it, maybe I never get a chance to work in the space again, and I want to make this as full and as big as a, of a thing so that people won't even dream about asking for an expansion. Mm-hmm. That said, of course I've got notes for other, other stuff I would add in, 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 in places where I, I can build out the system. But that will depend on how well the game does. And if people like it, I mean, maybe... I, I always accept the possibility that I'm I'm building something that I really uh, love and I really want to exist, and I hope that uh, it makes you know the backers made it possible that everyone's happy. But it's possible that we're just a bunch of weirdos on like a little weirdo island, and no one else is going to like this thing. But so there I, are weirdos. I know, but uh, you always <laughs> want to allow for that possibility yeah. uh, and, and not feel sad about it. Now, on the other hand, if like root, it resonates with a lot of. Um, if every year and a half or two years I have to work on some, something oath related, mm-hmm. I'll be a happy camper. Because yeah. there's a lot of room in the system yet. Yeah. Um, okay, we're coming up on an hour thirty. Okay. So we need to start. Let's wind it down. Start wrapping. Um, people are talking about trading copies. Um, about what? About trading copies for oath. Oh, oath trading oath copies. <laughs> um, awesome. I guess just kind of recap. Uh, we'll have an update. Mm-hmm. On Kickstarter on Thursday. Yep, Thursday there'll be a Kickstarter update. Uh, not like a super long development update, but a little update for people who were unable to miss the stream. I will give folks a link to Kit B, so if you or Kit C, sorry. Yeah. So if you want to make a physical copy, you'll be able to do that. And then we'll also have the TTS yeah. mod in all likelihood. Yeah. We'll, and we will have it. Yes. Yeah. And we will be playing that TTS mod. That day. That day. Thursday at 2 p.m. Central sure. Standard Time. All right, like that, that it? So, yeah, that's it, guys. Thank you very much. I hope you guys are liking what you're seeing here. There's, um, you know, it's funny. We're at a stage where, like, there's still a little bit to go, but so we are so close to being done with this game, and I cannot wait for you all to play it. It's a real scream. We have uh, some of the games both that we've played in the office have been, like, my favorite leader games, gaming experiences, mm-hmm. and that uh, I it partly speaks to the fact that it's really fun to play games with people here, in, in the studio, but also just everyone on the team has done an incredible job. I'm very grateful to uh, be working with these people. And Oath is the kind of, pro- like, even though I get to be on camera right now and be talking about the game, mm-hmm. this is the kind of game that, like, is not just me. Um, a lot of these cards were designed by members of the development team, and um, 
a lot, you know, like Josh has done a fabulous job on editing and usability. Kyle's art is amazing. Nick has been a champion uh, in tons of ways. Patty's done great on graphics. And, you know, the operations team and all the team around the game has also helped in play tests, helped think about, like, what this product looks like. I just realized that I have a giant stack of all the boxer insert stuff, which I'm not even going to bother talking about because we're already, like, way over time. Um, but th this, this game, I think... Um, all the games that we've made leader games are like team efforts, uh, and this is a game that demands has demanded the attentions of like the full team, uh, and I think it'll show when you guys get it. That's all I've got, Gates. Okay, so I'm gonna say goodbye. We'll talk to them later. Yeah, talk goodbye, to them on Thursday. Bye.